Welcome everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here today and opening up this great conference, uh, the RebelMQ Summit 2023, for the first time in Germany. Who of you actually lives in Germany? Yeah, not so many. Who of you lived in Germany 10 years ago already? Uh, even, even lower hands. Um, and who of you know the app QuizDuel? Two. We have two people in the round, at least. That's a good thing. Today I, want to like, I would like to tell you a story about QuizDuel. So, what is QuizDuel? QuizDuel is a mobile game, and it looks like this. It was developed in 2012 by a Swedish studio, and in 2013 the German version hit the mobile stores. In the game, you test the general knowledge against your friends, and it works like this. You get, four, you get a question with four answers, and you have a 20-second time frame to choose an answer. After you have chosen all the answers, you can select the next category, and you, you wait for your friend to answer the same questions again, and after a couple of rounds, you know who's smarter. But now the app was incredibly successful in Germany. So I remember in the year of its release, I was, was literally urged by my friends to play along. There was no way around that. And the studio rode that wave. So they partnered with a German TV station called ARD, one of Germany's public TV stations even, and they came up, they came up with a show that brings the game principle onto the TV screen. Meine Damen und Herren, ich freue mich, dass Sie mit dabei sind. Größten TV-Experiment des Jahres. Quizduell kann jetzt live gespielt werden. What a great idea. And believe me, really innovative for Germany in 2014. So the idea here is that the collective intelligence of of the of the uh, of the of the um, of Germany is competing against the studio. So again, you have a 20-second time frame to choose an answer on your phone, and the answer that is chosen most is the one for Team Germany. And we wissen jetzt wirklich nicht, was passiert. Hier sind zum ersten Mal drei Kategorien: Essen und Trinken. Draußen wird jetzt bereits gespielt. Normalerweise habe ich jetzt an dieser Stelle immer schon Ergebnisse von draußen. Es scheint ein bisschen äh, zu dauern. Hören Sie was? Ich höre gerade, wir haben noch keine, reden wir einfach ein bisschen weiter. Ich weiß, dass momentan User vorliegen 1,4 Millionen, die spielen. Und jetzt ist genau das passiert, von dem im Vorwege gesagt wurde, das kann niemals passieren. Die Server sind überlastet, wir haben keine Daten, anplagt ein bisschen spielen. Ja. Da wurde mir noch gesagt, Jörg, da wette ich meinen Mors drauf, die brauchen wir nicht. Das stimmt. Jetzt 1 zu 0. Did you hear that? 1.4 million users are playing. And there are technical problems. Surprise. So this setup is every backend developer's nightmare. You have a new app, you have a new backend, you have a 6 p.m. show on German television, and 1.4 million, million users are playing along. The absolute nightmare. So hopefully no one in this round is surprised that this doesn't work out well. Do you know the five stages of grief? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Well, I could already observe some denial here in the moderator, but as the show continues, we can also observe the other phases. Wir spielen klassisches Quiz ohne, <laughs> <laughs> ohne App. Sie können die Daumen drücken, dass wir das Team Deutschland irgendwo im Netz finden. Willkommen zurück! Es ist tatsächlich geglückt, wir sind gehackt worden. Ein Server abgerauscht. Glückwunsch dazu. Nur blöd, ihr könnt kein Geld gewinnen. Nur noch für euch, wenn das geklappt hätte mit der App, hättet ihr auch einen Joker gehabt. Ein Falls Sie jetzt erst zuschauen, meine Damen und Herren, virtuell mit Millionen von Usern. Nur die Ergebnisse kommen hier nicht an, weil Computerfreaks das Ganze gehackt haben. Wir machen im nächsten Jahr mal was mit App. Weltweit sind 15.000 Server zurzeit von einem einzigen User blockiert. Chapeau. Ich möchte zu gern wissen, wie er aussieht. Eine schöne Zahl. I don't know about you, but I felt some anger here. 
And the other face is continuing. Falls Sie jetzt erst reinschauen und denken, was machen die denn? Wir sind gehackt worden, ist tatsächlich einer der 15.000 Server weltweit blockiert. Falls der jetzt auch noch zugucken soll, hab doch zumindest den Hintern in der Hose, melde dich und dann kannst du hier auch mal spielen. Wir können uns mal unterhalten, hat auch keine juristischen Konsequenzen. Wahrscheinlich ist der, der uns gehackt hat, der Einsatz ja, der ja, verbotenen genau. Liebe. Also liebe Kollegen der verbotenen Liebe, vielleicht morgen schon wieder. Willkommen zurück zum quiz -Duell. Wir können immer noch nicht mit der Welt da draußen spielen. Lass uns doch mal was mit einer App machen. Das haben wir davon. Ein einzelner User hat 15.000 Server belegt. Und das, meine Damen und Herren, war der Versuch, App ins Fernsehen zu holen. Ging komplett in die Hose. Wir sind gehackt worden. Das war's. Machen Sie es gut. Tschüss. Ja, yeah. hacked. Of course. A single computer freak did that. That's also what the German newspapers wrote in the day after. Yeah. The attack of the master hacker, it's like being hacked. This show has been hacked, it was all over the news in Germany. But of course, it's not so, no surprise for you probably, this was not a hacker. The backend simply couldn't handle the load in the first place. You have a new app, you have a new backend, and 1.4 million concurrent users at once. The whole thing was an unintentional denial of service in the first place. So, The cloud provider was not able to spawn new instances fast enough to handle this amount of, of load. You heard there were 15,000 servers spawned already, and I know from first hand that this number is not made up. In the following episodes, the moderator reinforced this narrative of the hacker, <coughs> and it took them five episodes to finally more or less get the situation under control. Performance is a non-functional requirement. Our stakeholders don't tell us that they want a performant application. They want an application that works. So performance is implicit. If it's not performance, we can't meet any of the requirements that we have on our application. The users can't use any of the features that you developed over years to finally get the release ready. It must withstand the load, and it must be responsive. If it not, it costs us a lot of money. Let's take retail as an example as well. In the months of November and December, retailers make around 30% more money compared to the other months of the year. So, especially for toys and electronics, these months are extremely valuable. If the online store goes down during this time, it threatens your very existence. The businesses plan with this effect. So, performance is not an issue as long as nothing goes wrong. But as soon as something goes wrong, it happens at the most inappropriate time. And this is just due to the nature of the business. Quiz2L was particularly successful. So, a particularly large amount of people wanted to play. The product was simply good. For some reasons, we Germans love to do quiz. And because of its success, this load was created in the first place. If the servers can't cope with the load during the Christmas shopping seasons, it is because a particularly large number of people want to buy something and because the business generates a lot of money in that time. For us, who are responsible for technology, this is a lose-lose situation. At that moment, the business is particularly good, and we lose a lot in the business while we technicians get all the pressure and all the blame of the company, and we don't want that. We have to prevent this situation. While we end up in this situation over and over again has, of course, as always, a lot of reasons. But two of them I would like to highlight here. In the case of Quiz2L, we can observe the classic outsourcing dilemma. So, ARD, of course, didn't develop the app itself. They do television and not software engineering. So, they put the contract out to a tender. And a medium-sized provider in Cologne won it in 2013. And how do you win a tender? Well, by offering the largest scope at the lowest price, obviously. 
And non-functional requirements are simply not sexy to offer. If you are 20, 30, or 50 percent more expensive than your competition, just because you want to run extensive load tests on the same hardware like on production with 15,000 servers, then this is not a sexy se thing to sell. If your competitors is cheaper than you, you have a hard time selling your product. Selling quality is much harder than lowering the prices. And especially when you negotiate with non-technical people, this problem gets more and more intensive. So technical people can't judge whether or not this cost is justified. They need the expert's judgment on this decision. The second thing is what I call the mentorship crisis. It's the naivety of the development teams that we have. As a department team, as a department head, I was responsible for many teams myself. And today, as a freelancer, I work with many different teams. I talk with many decision makers, and I get to know many developers. In the past three to five years, I attended around 150 interviews, so I really got a good insight into our industry. And what you can see is that we have, in general, a seniority problem um, in, in our industry. So Robert C. Martin also wrote a famous blog called My Lawn in 2015 to this topic. Robert C. Martin, in case you don't know him, is one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto as well and is doing software development for, I think, 40 or 50 years already. He wrote that according to a study from IDC, in 2014 there were roughly 22 million programmers worldwide. In 1974, there was more around 100,000 developers out there. So by this number alone, the number of developers increased by 220 times within this 40 years. And this corresponds to a doubling rate of number of developers every five years. And this consideration is has glaring consequences. It's even hair rising. It results in 50% of the developers out there today developing software have less than five years of professional experience. Wow! You can also observe this by looking at the age distribution on Stack Overflow. Most developers are younger than 30 years. In what other industry out there would someone with more than five years already be considered an old hand, the one to look up to, the experienced people that can teach all the others. I wouldn't trust a doctor leading in a hospital with just five years of experience. But this is our reality. From five years on, you are a senior. It's this magic barrier from which we award this title. But the truth is, most of them simply, simply haven't had the experience of working on an application under load within these five years. And even if they did, even less from, uh, even fewer of them were responsible for the performance of the application. Only very few of us had the chance to work on an application under load. And after, only after many years in the industry, I realized that I was one of the few and lucky ones that had this opportunity. But it's a rare occasion. Today, I want that you want to avoid this situation. Even if you haven't had the experience yourself, there are things and experiences you can gather from others to avoid such a disaster that we just saw. So today, I want to share with you eight lessons. Lesson number one, know the requirements. What do we actually want to know when we look at the load of our application? Does it help us if we ask our product owner how many visitors our website will have each month? Maybe that's the number you get when you ask him. But that's not the number we are interested in directly. He's interested in that because he wants to know the revenue at the end of the month. But we, as programmers and technicians, we are interested in much more details here. So this number is related, but it's not what we, what we want to know in the end. We need to know 
what we have to cope with at the peak of our application. So how many visitors do we have on the weekend before Christmas? Or in the case of Crystal, how many visitors watch the show and participate with the app? We are interested in the CCU, the concurrent users in the spike. And it's your job to ask the right question to get to this number and do an educated guess when you're not live yet. So let's take, ex let's take QuizDuel as an example. The show is scheduled to run weekdays at 6 p.m. and now the ratings of public televisions is uh, freely available. And if you look them up for some representative dates, you end up with one to one and a half million viewers for a 6 p.m. show. So let's prepare for the worst case here and take the upper end, one and a half million, million viewers. So how many of those one and a half million viewers will use the app? We can't know, so we need to guess again, maybe two out of three. So we end up with one million app users that we expect. But since it's the pilot episode, the rush will be especially high. So let's take the number a little bit higher, put some buffer on it, maybe 20%, and we end up with one to two million users. Now, you remember, it were actually 1.4 million users. So even I, with the information I get today, would have significantly underestimated here. But it's over the thumb. It's something that you need to figure out when you want to go live with your application. And also, we today and now around here and from the outside, we also don't have the resources, we don't have the insights to, to come up with a better number. Probably you have when you get into a product and work on it for years. But this is what you need to do. Think about how many users will use your application. So, but even now with this number, we are, we are not there yet. This is still not what we want to know if we want to test the load of, uh, or the performance of our application. This number is not precise enough yet. We also need to look at the user's behavior. And this is, of course, different for every system out there. But in the case of Crystal, it's real, relatively easy to predict. So you have this 20-second time frame. And we know when we have 1.4 million users, probably we, we, got, we will get 1.4 million answers that get chosen by them. So what we also know is that these 1.4 million requests will probably not be evenly distributed within this 20 second time frame. So probably we expect something like this. In the beginning, we just have a view request because everyone is still reading the question and thinking about it. And then in the end, probably we see some, some form of spike because everyone who's still discussing with his partner on the couch is quickly choosing an answer to send at least something out. So we could expect to get one million requests within the last five seconds here. And now when we evenly distribute that, we end up with 200,000 re requests per second. And this is what we are interested in. This is the educated guess we need to develop. We need to think about the behavior of our users. We need to think about how many users will use the application and then come up with this number so we even know what we need to cope with. So now we have our benchmark. This is what we want to achieve. And now we need to generate a load test that simulates these 200,000 requests. And by that, we come to lesson number two, proof that you meet your requirements. Proof is a strong word. You can never prove something 100%. I hope this is clear for everyone. But we need to do it as good as possible. Even though computers are deterministic and we could prove what a computer is doing, the user's behavior is not and will not, uh, not be in, in any future. So we need to get as close as possible. We have to approximate here. So if we expect to get 200,000 requests per second, we can simulate that. And for that, we use tools. There are a bunch of tools out there in all kinds of technologies and tech stacks. And in my world, I'm mainly working on the uh, JVM and in the Java ecosystem. There's tools like Gatling, Locust, JMeter, BlazeMeter, and many more. In principle, it doesn't matter which tool you choose. But 
a couple of things you need to make sure that the tool is providing. First, that you are able to generate the load in the first place. Generating 200,000 requests is not a simple thing to do. And you need to make sure that your tool can do that. Your local PC probably won't. You probably need another cluster to generate this amount of load. And your tool must support that. So please also don't have the idea to write the load test on your own without using a tool that can scale horizontally. You probably will fail with that very soon. Second, <coughs> you have a good reporting on your tool as well. So you need to report what the tool is generating like you report everything on your live application. And I tell you that because I had issues. I once did the load test and the application looked very fine. I was even surprised that there was nearly no pressure on the application at all just to figure out that the tool was not generating the load in the first place. So you need to have some reporting here to check that. Also, you're probably very interested in that because the load test is a client that uses your application. So measuring the request duration on the side of your load test is something that is very interesting because it goes through the, uh, your whole stack. Third. Your tool must be able to simulate a realistic warm-up. So in the case of Crystal, we have 1.4 million users that uses the system. And your tool must be able to create this amount of data, also in a realistic time frame, and of course without breaking your system before you actually test what you want to test. And fourth, it should be within your tech stack. So you need to be able to maintain your tool for a long time a load test should be written while you also develop your main application. And so everyone in your team should be able to participate in doing so. And you make it easier by choosing a tool that is within your tech stack and maybe even using the same language as your main application. Make it easy for your colleagues to extend the load test that you have. Now, we know what we want to measure and we know how we want to measure it. Now we get a bunch of data. And by that, we come to lesson number three, know your statistics. <coughs> we generated a load, a load of a, a bunch of data now, a bunch of numbers, but we humans are very bad in interpreting them. So just looking at numbers doesn't help us at all. What we need to do is we need to do some visualization of them. That's how we humans can work and make sense out of data. And we measured all kinds of stuff now. We measured infrastructure met metrics like CPU utilization and memory acquisitions. We measured application metrics like request durations and error rates. We measured bus business metrics like answers given or completed purchases. And now we need to make sense out of them. So what do we actually want to know and what do we want to receive out of this data? What I mean with that I want to demonstrate with an example. Let's look at this graph. This visualization is apparently displaying all endpoint latencies in milliseconds. So what we see here, every line is representing one endpoint and an HTTP method on it. The question is here now, can we make sense out of this graph, at least if it stays alone? And I would say we can't. Because even though we have different endpoints here, okay, we see that as apparently this what is it? Maybe the delete operation is taking longer than the others, but we don't know what actually the y-axis is. We don't know what latency means in this context. Is it the average of all the requests that come in? Is it the maximum? Or is it some really weird calculation that we did there? We don't know this out of this graph. So this, in my opinion, is not a good, uh, good visualization, at least when you look at this isolated. A better visualization of the same thing is this one. We again visualize the request durations, but instead of visualizing all the endpoints, we only focus on one endpoint in particular, and we show different percentiles of the same data. Who remembers what percentiles are? Who remembers statistic classes? Not all the hands go up. Let me give you a short recap on that. So percentile, let's start with the 50% percentile. The 50% percentile is most of the time also called the median. And it is when you have 
a, a series of data, so all the recrystallizations within one second, and you sort them, you take the one data point that is exactly in the middle of this, of this series. The 99 percentile, on the other hand, is the one value that is on the 99th percent position of the series. So when you have 200 data points, it's the data point at position 198. And by doing so, we can interpret much more into this graph. So what we see here in the spike is, yeah, we have a very, very bad recrystallization here with more than up more than 10 seconds, so we have a spike here, but we also see that this is an outlier because it's just the 99 percentile. This means 99 percent of the users are actually below this data point and have a better regress duration. And when we look at the other visualization with the 95 percent, we see, okay, everything is apparently all right here. 95 percent of our users have a good regress duration. So we observe that we have outliers here, but we also know now that we don't have, have a real problem into our application. And since our applications are so complex nowadays, there will always be outliers. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't uh, do anything about that. So now we have visualization, but we also, of course, need to interpret that. That's what we did now, we need to do for all our metrics. So by that we come to lesson number four, know your runtime inside out. I once was responsible for an application where we had strange timeouts every two hours on a development environment. This is a screenshot I, I took back then. I believe it was in 2021, if I remember correct. What we see here are two graphs that are related to the CPU. On the left side, you see CPU utilization, and on the right side, you see the CPU load. Who remembers what the difference between the CPU utilization and the load is? Uh, not so many hands. This is also the expression I get. When you are at some point in an interview with me, be prepared, I will show this graph. The CPU and the load is both, or the CPU utilization and the load is both representing data from the CPU. Let's start with the left one. That's probably the one you're used to. Um, this is what you look at when your personal machine is going slow when you open up the task manager on Windows or HTOP on, on Unix machines. This is probably what you look at. The CPU utilization is displaying how much time of the avail available time of a CPU is actually spent calculating. So when we have here 40% of CPU utilization, it means that 40% of the time the CPU is doing real work, doing real calculations, and the other 60% of the time it's doing something else, probably idling. The load, on the other hand, is also representing a statistic from the CPU but with a slightly different perspective. To explain that, let's take a step back. Let's remember how our PCs are tricking us in doing parallel execution. So when you have a system, a CPU with just one core, of course, this core can only do one thing at a time. That's just physics. There's only one stream of electrons going through the CPU. But in order to simulate parallel execution, we have a scheduler right before the CPU, and this scheduler makes sure the tasks are switched around in the CPU, and it does this in a very, very fast manner, and it's maintaining a queue to schedule these tasks. And the size of the queue, how many tasks are waiting in this queue in order to be, to be scheduled on the CPU, is displayed as the load. So when we have a, sp a spike here of 30, this means that we have 30 tasks in this period of time waiting for execution in the CPU. So another detail maybe here, we see here in the legend is the system 1M metric. So this is the one minute load, which means it's more or less the average within one minute that we're waiting in this queue. It's not exactly right, it's actually a sliding window algorithm uh, calculating that, but it's enough to, to interpret this graph. 
Also, when you open up HTOP, uh, you, when you and look at the load there, you also always see three numbers. Uh, the first number is the one minute load, what we also display in this graph. The second number is the five minute load, and the third number is the 15 minute load. So, you just get another, another um, time frame for this calculation. Also, on this graph, you see this yellow line here at the, at the bottom. This is actually not the x axis, by the way. This is the number of cores we had on the system, and it's constant on the one. So what does this mean now? This means we only have one core, which can only do one thing at a time, but we want to do 30 things at a time. And this is hinting us to a problem. This is potentially showing us that we have a problem in the system. In this system. Not necessarily. Yeah? This is because Linux systems also um, display load times in the, in the, uh, the um, I.O. load times in the, in the load itself, but it can hint us that there is a problem, that there are too many tasks piling up in front of the CPU that the CPU can, can't handle fast enough and context switching is killing your application. And this is exactly what happened here. So actually on this system, on the same machine, we had another process running. It was a log aggregator, and this log aggregator was opening up a lot of files, doing a lot of I.O. operations, and that's why we see this behavior here. And this log aggregator was blocking our main application. Without actually doing something, it was just waiting for stuff. And this is what I mean by know your runtime. You need to know where your application is running on. And you need to know how this works. You need to understand how the operating system works. You need to understand all the abstraction layers that we use today, how hypervisors work, how the cloud is working, how Kubernetes works, how the abstractions between nodes and pods are represented in Kubernetes, how Docker is working, because that's where your application is running on. And if you are working with a language like Java, like I do, you even have the JVM in between there as well. So there are so many abstraction layers, and you need to understand how they interact with each other. Otherwise, you can't make sense out of the, out of the metrics you gather. So take another basic book. I do this once in a while. I take another Linux basic book and get familiar again with how the, the system works. Lesson number five. <clears throat> performance is not a one-ticket problem. So performance issues can hit you any time. Every change you do on your system, and nevertheless, it uh, doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a change in code or if it's a change in infrastructure, every change can affect your performance. And you cannot solve this topic just with a single effort like this. And I experienced that. Yeah? A PO coming to me, yes, next sprint, we fix performance. Easy. Of course, you, of course you cannot do that. You need to work on it continuously. You need to collect metrics. You need to do load tests in a regular in a regular uh, phase, and you need to understand your system. And by that, I already come to lesson number six, integrate performance into your daily life to achieve that. I believe this is the only way to really care about the performance of your system. As soon as you're alive, you need to watch the application. You need to learn how your application behaves, how it feels, how the graphs are behaving throughout the day, throughout the week. This brings you in the position to even detect anomalies when they, when they occur. So make it a habit to look at the most important metrics on a daily basis. For example, when you're working in an office, buy a large TV screen, display your Grafana boards on there, just to look at them very often when you, when you go into your office. Or if you work remotely, um, you can make it a habit to open up the dashboard in your daily. Also, make sure that your load tests can be run all the time. So, run them every night and include a small variant of your load test into your CI pipeline. Just with a single user, doing the load test just with a single request, but by doing so, you make sure that your load test doesn't break. And the developer who changes the API also adjusts the load test accordingly. And by the way, when you do that, you also have an excellent end-to-end -end test because for the most important features, that's usually the ones you will also want to load test, you make sure that the application is doing the right thing. Optimizing for performance is a marathon and it's not a sprint. But when you really need to optimize for certain targets, make sure that you know lesson number seven. 
there's always a further wall. When you figure out that you can handle only 100 requests per second today, but you need to handle 200,000, you don't know which problems you will face on the, on the way to achieve that. The next bottleneck is never visible from the data that we currently have. When 100 is the current limit, maybe the next one is 200, maybe even 2,000, but maybe it's also just 120. You simply can't know what effect your changes will have to the system. You cannot estimate that, and you need to be very transparent with that situation in your company and in your business. So be prepared for that. It can take months until you finally hit this magic number you want to hit, because you might need to do very large refactorings. Maybe you need to change your overall architecture. Maybe you need to be able to scale horizontally. Maybe you need to include a rabbit MQ to achieve that. But this is not an easy thing to do. It will take a lot of time. Be transparent about this and talk with it about your uh, talk about this issue with your product owner and your colleagues. But the last lesson I want to talk about today is maybe the most important one. Optimize for perceived performance. In the end, it doesn't matter what all our statistics are saying. It doesn't matter if we really hit this magic number. What really matters is how the user feels the application and how the user experiences the application when he's using it. Our PCs are already tricking us. Maybe you remember the explanation of the load in order to simulate parallel execution the PCs are tricking us already. And we can do that as well in our application. Maybe you remember Windows and Mac OS in the early 2000s or end of 90s. I don't know exactly when, when this behavior was present, but Mac OS and Windows felt very different in that time. Mac OS or Apple understood very early that it's the most important, the most important threat on the system is the UI rendering threat. Because when you open up an application, you still want to get the impression that the system is fluent, so the mouse needs to be smooth and nice on your display. You had this nice spinning rainbow bubble next to the mouse, and everything still felt fluent. Windows, in the same time frame, felt very different. They evenly distributed the task on the different threads, and when you opened up an application on Windows 98, for example, uh, you had staggering mouses, um, and uh, you really felt that the system was under pressure and doing some very hard stuff there. Even if Windows was faster overall, macOS always felt, felt much faster on the same hardware. You can use that as well. So in your application, if you have tasks that take multiple seconds and you can't do anything about it, maybe it's a good idea to introduce a loading bar, write on it what hard work you do there, yeah, how many servers you need to set up to just serve this single user, and the user will feel better about it. Make tasks asynchronous when it's possible. Um, the perceived performance is what matters in the end. So let me wrap this up. First, know the requirements. Know what you need to optimize for. Figure out the expected CCU by talking to all the stakeholders and getting all the data that you can get. Figure out how many requests they will generate in the spike. S second, run low test end to end. Make sure that your tool is fitting well into your tech stack so you can also maintain your tool over the lifetime of your, of your application. Third, make sense out of your data. We need good visualization in order to make sense out of the data, and you need to put effort in that. It's not a waste of time to work on good visualization. Fourth, understand the underlying system. Read a Linux book again. Do that from time to time and understand all the abstraction layers that you have in between. Fifth, you need to work on performance constantly. It's not a one-ticket problem, and you can't solve it once and never make it a topic again. Second, integrate performance into your daily life. In order to do so, look at your most important metrics on a daily basis and get a feeling how your application behaves. Seventh, you never know 
how many walls are out there. If you climb the first one, there will be many more to come and you could never know how many you need to climb. Eight, optimize for perceived performance. In the end, what matters is how the application feels for your user. So optimize for that and make it a good experience for your user when they use the application. I believe after so many years doing software development with so many teams that at some point in your career it's not about knowing basics and getting to know basic basic uh, functionality of, of languages and technologies. I think in order to become more senior, you need to talk about values and share experiences like I did today. And I do that regularly. So I write a newsletter two times a week and share experience there from my day-to-day -day work. You won't get any tips and tricks on this newsletter. You also don't get just another tutorial for some technology and you also don't get actually actual news, even though I still call it a newsletter. It's more like a journal. So this newsletter is about sharing experiences and giving you inspiration to leave your day-to-day -day habit and maybe do something different in your day-to-day -day work. It's short, it's entertaining, it's fun, it's really personal, and it's free. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up on backendhearts.com slash newsletter. I'm happy for every new reader. I'm happy to receive feedback as well, so feel free to get into a discussion with me. And, of course, you can unsubscribe every time. I don't take it personal. That's was. Machen Sie es gut. Vielleicht morgen verboten die Liebe. Wer weiß es. Tschüss. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great day here at the RabbitMQ Summit 2023 and uh, enjoy the talks to come. Thank you.